Riverside family. How are you this morning? We're going to try that again. Good morning. I'm going to have you stand. I know we had one hour less of sleep this morning, but first service was awake. Are you awake? Yeah, you're ready to worship the Lord? You're ready to worship our Savior? Do we need to do the hokey pokey to wake you up? I think we're still welcoming people in, but welcome, family. The Holy Spirit is already present here, already ready to be worshiped, already to hear us sing the praises of all that is holy, all that is blessed in his name. So let's go ahead and get started, okay? Good to see everybody this morning. If you're online, thank you so much for joining us. Worship from wherever you are. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry
continue to worship this morning. There will be prayer teams on both sides of the stage that would love to pray with you this morning.
darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the
Dear Lord, I thank you for this time of worship. Lord, I'm so thankful that we can come here and worship you freely, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, I pray as Steve comes up and teaches this morning, that you just open hearts and minds, Lord God. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would work in every single life, Lord. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, Riverside. You're, you're pretty chipper for losing an hour of sleep. Nice work. Good job. My name is Peggy Orlando, and I'm the communications director here. And it is an absolute privilege to be able to say welcome home. This is your first time joining us this morning. If you'll do us a favor and visit riversidechurch.org 411, click the connect button and just fill out a little bit of information about yourself so that we can know who you are. And then after service, you'll go through the double doors on the left-hand side, there's a first-time guest area. We have a free gift. We'd love to be able to introduce ourselves and answer any questions that you may have as you take your next step here at Riverside. If you're joining us online, if you visit riversidechurch.org 411, click the connect button and someone from our guest services team will reach out to you to help you take your next step as well. This is the time in our service where we get to give back a part of what God has given us because we believe that we are stewards and not owners of what God has given and we wanna give back. And so there are four ways for you to do that. You can find all of the links and information at riversidechurch.org slash give. And if you're new here or if you've been here for a little while, you've heard us say riversidechurch.org slash 411. And I'm just here to remind you that that is your one-stop shop for all things Riverside. So you can download the Riverside app or just visit that URL. And I've been told, I vaguely remember it, I'm a 90s kid, that the 411 was something you could call and it would tell you information, I think, maybe. Um, and I also, I think it was a phrase like, hey, what's the 411? And you would tell them the information. I don't really remember that, but I've been told that that's accurate. So think of that. The 411 page is all the information that you need for what's going on. So if you are a man, a woman, a senior, if you are a parent, if you are a student, if you are a young adult, there is something on the 411 page for you right now. So take out your phones. Do it. I'll wait. Take them out. There is um, a girls' night out happening and an if gathering, and there's a senior sunrise, nope, not sunrise, senior sunset cruise. Um, that has limited seating, so you're gonna wanna register for that. Um, what else? Student camp, that's coming up. Um, men's and women's studies are happening. I can't even remember all the details. Our Easter times are on there. The 411 page. If you haven't looked at it in a while, it's been updated this morning, so it's, the newest and most important information for all things Riverside. Riversidechurch.org slash 411. That is all I have for you this morning, and Steve is here with another message in our Hot Mess series. Back at the turn of the century, right, Peggy? <laughs> does every is anybody here never? I, well, never mind. I don't want to ask that and have to do that. That doesn't seem that long ago when you'd call four one one to get information, right? Okay, things are changing fast. Welcome to twenty twenty four. Uh, I would love to remind you that in two weeks, three weeks, Easter is coming. Easter's coming really fast. March thirty first. So it's in March this year. We will be here on Easter Sunday at 8, at 9.30, and at 11. And then Good Friday, a couple days before, we'll be here at 6.30. However, if you have a family, especially a young family, it doesn't have to be, but there's a thing back in the kids' ministry called Journey to the Cross. They're doing an interactive experience at 
uh, five on Good Friday where you can come and you'll self-guide, kind of parent guide uh, your kids through the events leading up to the death and crucifixion of Jesus. So it actually, that sounds really dark and it's Good Friday, but it'll be a lot of fun. It's a really neat way to walk through some of what happened in those events. So watch for that back there in the kids' men. Uh, so that is Easter. We tell, uh, we, sorry, I can't get my words together this morning. It was that hour of sleep. We talk among the staff that uh, Good Friday is for us, where we come and we get time, and then on Easter Sunday, we, we invite friends. But you boaters, what about you boaters? This year, unofficially, one of our elders has a heart for people with boats, and they're doing a sunrise service at 7 at Deep Lagoon on McGregor. There's a restaurant there, but that area is actually called Deep Lagoon. 7 a.m., that's mile marker 72. If you're on the river, you can come by boat or by land. There'll be a sunrise service there. He's trying it this year, and uh, we're kind of excited about that. But if you go at 7, you will not make it back here at 8, so be thinking about that. That's one of our elders. Speaking of elders, I have a dear friend who has served as an elder for the last six years. Kevin, will you come on up? Aaron, do you want me to invite you to this service or just skip over it? Okay, yeah. Kevin is a dear friend. He um, not only has served on our elder board the last six years, but he's been our elder chair for the last four-ish, right? Yeah. You said 15 earlier. In the, <laughs> sorry, I, I, for, I needed to get you a microphone. Um, but as per our bylaws, Elders, after six years, have to take a, take a break and take a little time off to rest and just be part of the body and not be carrying the mantle of leadership. So I want to thank you for the time that you have spent not only as an elder, as uh, our elder chair, but I'm so deeply grateful for your friendship. If there's any other elders here, uh, come up. We're going to take a minute and pray for Kevin, former elders too. You should come up here and pray for him. Well, you don't have to. You just sit there. Um, not like he's one of your best friends, but anyway. <laughs> he is one of his best friends. That was, I meant that lovingly. That's Kevin, a dear, dear friend, and I'm so grateful for your voice in my life, for your wisdom uh, with the elders, but also your heart, not only for Jesus, but for the church and to guide and lead and serve her well. So we've got a little gift for you. You can open a minute and um, to pray for you. Father, I'm so grateful for Kevin, for his friendship, for, uh, as I've said, his, his voice in my life, his continued friendship. I look forward to many more years of that. And God, I'm, I'm grateful for his service, for his wisdom, his leadership, but also some time to rest and just be part of the body. And God, I ask that you use that time well to uh, give him clarity on what this season means and uh, that there would be joy and uh, just refreshment. And God, I thank you for your word that you've given us, that you speak to us through, and you tell us that you will meet us, and you, you tell us your word will not return to you void. And so, Lord, we pray that you just meet us in it this morning and guide our time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, love bro. You. Love you. Amen. Should I go up this one? Yeah, go. Yeah, thanks. Oh, my gosh. All right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you spry young pup. If I had just done that, I wouldn't have got hurt nearly as bad as what I tried to do that day when I stepped down onto that speaker. It's just a very bad idea. Wow, that's going to take me a minute. Gabby, did you see that? No. Okay. I did. It is my fault. I invited you up. Um, some really, really good friends. And wow, I'll remember that for a long time, Taylor. Thank you. So I'm going to make a confession. Several years ago, I got hooked on The Walking Dead. Uh, that is a TV show about the zombie apocalypse. It ran for 11 years. The main theme, you'd see this over and over, is that the humans were worse to each other than the zombies ever were. And uh, at the time, we lived in the sub suburbs of Atlanta, and so it was a big deal there because it was being filmed in and around Atlanta, and sometimes you could find familiar places. But I avoided the hype for the longest time. I refused to watch it. I thought, it just seems too dark and brutal. I don't need that. And then 
uh, one day a friend was with Wendy and I and she told us she had been in an episode in season three and uh, this is her in this car. You can't see it. <laughs> I searched for a photo that wasn't just gruesome and brutal. It's like that's the best photo I could find that didn't have like gore everywhere. Uh, it was really, she's credited in the credits. She was listed as Mexican woman, which we thought was really funny because she's Puerto Rican, but it, it is what it is. <laughs> In it, she gets rescued, if you ever watched it, by Daryl and his brother, Yondo. Um, I didn't know any of that until I watched that episode. And then I got curious, and then I got pulled into the show. And the series would make you care about individual characters right before it killed them off. And it was repeatedly depressing and discouraging. And I realized I've got to break this thing's grip on me when my favorite character, Glenn, died. There's a spoiler, sorry. And I thought I literally, I, I would get anxious and stressed about these make-believe characters. And so I came up with a plan. I let a couple of episodes pass me by we were watching it on streaming. I was watching it alone on streaming. And uh, I went on the internet and I read the endings. I just read the spoilers on the paper and it released my grip. I could read through that. I didn't have any emotional connection. Oh, I knew they were going to do that. And they, I'm just reading it and I broke free of the show. Read the ending and then I had no more anxiety. So I believe... Knowing the ending reduces anxiety. A friend, Scott, tells a story, a similar story about a baseball game, and he was so stressed when he watched the game, but the second time he watched it, he wasn't stressed at all because he knew how it ended. Knowing the ending reduces anxiety. It also lets you think clearly. In my case, I finally detached from these make-believe people who were affecting my mood. Knowing the ending lets you think more clearly and make better decisions. I think that's part of what's happening at the end of chapter seven in the book of First Corinthians that's in your Bible. If you got a Bible, flip over there, make your way to chapter seven, you can download one, there's free ones out in the lobby. I'll, I'll show you where you can find that in just a minute. In this chapter, we're introduced to something that's going on to the, at the church in Corinth. There's a crisis of some kind. And so there's anxiety. And Paul reminds them of the ending so that they can make good decisions. Specifically, he speaks to virgins or unmarried people and maybe even engaged people. And married people too, but first to virgins. And he doesn't tell them just any old ending. He reminds them of the ending of eternity. And that should inform the questions they are asking and the decisions they make. So work your way over there. We're going to be in the New Testament, half of the Bible that clarifies, explains, describes the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we'll be right here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. We'll start at verse 25. And one of the things I think this passage will help us answer is how eternity uh, should inform your decisions. So let me read, let me start at verse 25. He begins like this. Now concerning the betrothed. And this is interesting because in chapter six, we saw that Paul was addressing questions they had asked him. There's evidence all over this that they had sent him a letter with questions in it. And we think he's addressing one here also. This, um, sorry, I've got a rod in my arm now, so I have to, it messes with the antenna apparently. Now, there's, it's the gift that keeps on giving when you do something as dumb as fall off a stage. So the now concerning refers back to a question that they have sent, a question about the betrothed, which in the Greek, in the original language, this is the word virgins or parthenos. It's the word that's used in the Bible of the Virgin Mary. And then there's four unmarried virgin daughters uh, who were prophets of, the of Philip, the evangelist. And here, specifically, it's in feminine plural. So these are female virgins. He's speaking specifically to female virgins. So why doesn't it just say that? Why don't they translate it that way? Because the translators are trying to correct an old view 
and clarify our best understanding of what's going on in this passage. We're gonna get into this, and I'm just gonna apologize. It's gonna be a little nerdy today. It's a complicated passage. It's hard to figure out, okay, what does this mean for me? But they're trying to fix the view, and if you get really curious, there's a great explanation uh, in Gordon Fee's commentary on 1 Corinthians, his excellent commentary. There have been three historical views on this passage. The oldest view thought it was just about virgins and whether their dads should give their hands in marriage. These things, they thought he's actually speaking to the parent, to the father of the virgin. Because when we get down to verse 37, they misunderstood what was happening in verse 37. Because there's a reference to a man and his own virgin, which we know now should just mean his, his betrothed, his engaged person. They thought it was talking about her dad, and that's why we don't translate it that way anymore to help clarify this is, that's not what this is about. That view is fairly well rejected. Second view was that this is referring to unmarried men and women living together without sex or sexual sin, which this is crazy, but that was a common practice later on among Christians from like the one, late 100s into the 400s which that's different, right? Community and family, there's non-sexual, but they're just living as friends together. It wasn't that rare. But there's no evidence that that's what's happening here or that early, and that leaves the third view. I know this nerd now, I'm losing you. Uh, the third view is there were Corinthians who had been pledged to be married, and they were either engaged or they were heading that way, and because of a distress, a present crisis, we'll get to that in a minute, because of that, they were asking questions about whether they should go through with the marriage or they should stay single. We think that's who he's talking to because of the crisis. And also, in the church at Corinth, they've been influenced by some other people, people whose influence we saw earlier in this book. There were Corinthians who were very eager to go past what God said and tell people, well, sex is dirty, even if you're married. They were going way beyond what scripture had provided. And that causes problems every time it happens, right? When people get what God says and they say, well, let's add our own rules to that too. So like God says, don't have sex outside of marriage or don't look at a woman lustfully or whatever clear command Jesus gives. And then people say, well, if God draws the line here, then we should back up from it and draw another line back. We'll build a fence back here. It's often well-intentioned, but that then starts to create pressure for everybody else. And say, so if he says don't do this, then we're gonna back way up here, so don't even get close to it. If you need to take God's command and build a boundary for yourself, because it's like, I can't, I'm too tempted here. I need a boundary over here so I don't get there. That's awesome, do that but you don't get to do that for everybody else. You see this all the time. The Bible says no sex outside marriage, and these, we say, well, we need more rules to that, these crazy kids. We're gonna make a rule, no holding hands, because that leads to rubbing elbows, and that leads to nakedness. Or <laughs> we do this. Jesus says, maybe not that one, but you've seen this. Jesus says, don't look at a woman lustfully. And so we'll say, well, don't look at women. Or, hey, women, the Bible commanded men not to look at you lustfully, so we want you to wear these floor-to-ceiling carpet dresses so we won't be tempted. We, we put the rules on somebody else, even though God gave the command to me. We project our training wheels. I think of it like training wheels. I've needed that in a number of places in my life where I'm learning to follow Jesus. It's like, wow, I can't quite handle that. I'm gonna stay over here for a while. But we put the training wheels on other people and that's not okay. It says things like don't get drunk, so we ban drinking. It's like, ah, oh, you gotta let everybody else kind of figure out where their own training wheels were. The Bible talks about coarse jesting and coarse talk and we think we ban certain words. It's like, that wasn't the thing. He's talking about what's coming out of your heart, the vomit that's coming out of your mouth. In Corinth, in the city where this letter was being written to, there was this great fear over sexual sin and it created these extreme views from the body doesn't matter at all to this asceticism that says you can't let the body have any pleasures. You gotta cut it off so it's better not to marry at all. And that was a pressure that was being put on these young engaged couples that wasn't fair, it wasn't right, and it's not what the Bible teaches. 
nor is it what Paul just taught in chapter seven. Earlier in chapter seven, he talks about this. And so when we get here and it's talking about singleness, it gets complicated because Paul was single and he believed there was advantage to that for the role he'd been given. So here in chapter seven, he actually tells us he's single in verse eight. But now as he answers this question, he makes a disclaimer. And it's a powerful disclaimer. There's two things that happen here. One, he's acknowledging that he's aware that he is writing scripture. That the words he's giving to the Corinthians are being guided by God. That's powerful. But also, in this specific instance, he says, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. He recognizes that in this next thing he's about to say, this is not God's command. This is his opinion as one who has known mercy. Isn't that cool? He doesn't assert his great wisdom. Now, I'm so wise, listen to me, or I am an apostle, by the way, so my opinions, he doesn't do that. He separates it. This isn't a place where God had spoken. So he says, here's my opinion. My, my opinion as one who has known the mercy of Jesus. I can be trusted because I've understood his mercy. So it's not a command. If you don't follow this part, it's not sin. But in view of the present distress, because the church at Corinth was facing a crisis. Some of your translations will say an impending distress. We think that's a wrong view of it. It wasn't something that was coming. They were facing something right now. Something was going wrong. It's not just that Jesus would return, but there was a crisis right then. That The verb use implies it's already there. And we don't know what that was. We know there was a famine in 51, year 51, so maybe it was that. We know there was persecution, and maybe that's what it's describing. Whatever it was, Paul weighs in, and he says, I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Which also implies he's not just speaking to the, the women in here, it's to both, those who were betrothed or engaged or moving toward it. It's not because of some giant theology or some command of God or a reason God gave. It's because of their circumstance, because they're in a crisis. My Greek professor said it like this in class one day. He said, all heck has broken loose, and I think it's good for you to stay as you are. I, that's the way I remember him saying it and how I wrote it down. I'm not sure that that's exactly how he said it. Um, if you read the rest of this, and I'm not gonna read all of it today, but go read this, and he explains some of that for them, for those uh, who were married. He's saying, because of the crisis, it's better that you stay single, and if you're not single, then here's what to do, and there's some debate as you go through it about is he talking to engaged people or married people, but then you finally get down to verse 29, and he says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. Okay, so that's a shift. He goes from they're in a crisis to he's no longer talking about the immediate crisis. Now he's talking about the end, the end of days, the return of Jesus. The time is, is short. And in view of that, it should affect the decisions you're making now. He brought up the return of Jesus. And so, and this part is complicated, from now on, this is really complicated, let those who have wise live as though they had none. Some of you are like, yes. Read the Bible, Steve. That, okay, there's context. I'm pretty sure he's not saying something here that negates the rest of Scripture. It doesn't, he's not saying neglect and abandon your family in the name of Jesus. That's not what's happening. Um, and he continues, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, which that is also really weird. Why would he say that? When the Bible says something that contradicts what else the Bible teaches, then you, you need to pay attention. Something else is happening there. He's making a list, and that's the first two. Live like, those who are married, live like you're not married. Those that mourn, live like you're not grieving. Uh, three is those who rejoice as though they're not rejoicing. These are all parallel if you put them out in Greek. So you have joy, act, live like you don't have joy. That doesn't make any sense. And four, uh, those who buy as though they had no goods. And five, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. And then finally, he makes this point. Four, or gar in Greek, because 
the present form of this world is passing away. Your attachment to it, you need to be careful in how you manage your attachment to the world because it's temporary. He's using rhetoric here. He's saying something. He's not saying neglect your spouse, don't cry for the dead, stop your rejoicing, ignore your house, and stop living in the world. He's not saying that. He used those phrases, but he says something that's intentionally absurd enough to realize, okay, he's not being literal here. He's describing a new reality. They have lived as pagans. The concerns of the world were all they knew, but now they are Christian. Things are different now. And it should affect the way they're living. Gordon Fee, in his book, says the Christian is marked by eternity. Therefore, he or she's not under the dominating power of those things that dominate the lives of others. These things have taken over your thoughts. Now you live as though not. There's a bigger thing going on here. Eternity needs to change their perspective and their priorities even in the face of the crisis they were in, there's a reminder there that this is not home. Of course you care for your family and you mourn and you rejoice and you buy and trade. You have to have food and clothing and and you deal with the world, but you're not like the world. You're marked by eternity. Your family is for Christ. You mourn as one with hope. We rejoice even in suffering. That's one where the scripture is really clear. James tells us over there, we rejoice in suffering because we know something bigger is coming. We buy and sell knowing that you're but a steward of God's resources. And you do business as one who is concerned with souls, not just profits. Eternity informs your decision. Which leads to what I think is the core idea of the passage. I want you to be free from anxieties. Does that work when you tell somebody, hey, I want you to not worry? One day in August, like in 2007, turn of the century, I was, um, I was at work and uh, our office was in North Dallas. We were right at the boundary, those of you who are from there, right at the boundary of Dallas County and Plano and Carrollton, right in that little corner. And I got a call and it came up on my phone as the city of Carrollton, because phones could do amazing things even way back in 2007. But when it comes up city of Carrollton, I'm like, that's unusual. And I answered it and a man's voice said, Mr. Pruitt, I don't want you to worry. He started with that, right? That doesn't work. The minute somebody says, oh, hey, I don't want you to worry, you're waiting on the but because you know something that I might worry about is going to follow in the next sentence. And then he proceeds to tell me, your wife is okay, but she's been in an accident and he was there calling me and and she was fine. But it's still, why does Paul start like this? Because he's not just addressing the negative side of this anxiety word. His thought continues. The unmarried man, single man, is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, which seems like a good thing, right? So anxious here is things that he should care about and be concerned about. So that makes me think we're misunderstanding something when we read this anxious word and read in, oh, anxiety is bad. And then he continues. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. The word he's using here is consistent. It's the same word in verse 32. It's merim na'o. Um, it means care or concern. It's not just a negative like worry, anxiety, stress. It's your, your burdened your care about these things and here it's just the adjective form of it with the a on the front the alpha that makes it the opposite so ah merimnos it means unburdened or unconcerned you're not worried i want you to unconcerned i don't want you to have these worries this is the same word that jesus uses when he says why are you anxious about what you wear 
But it's also the word that Paul uses when he writes to the church in Philippi, another letter in our New Testament. And he describes Timothy, his young follower, his young disciple, as he says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. It's a positive word when he describes Timothy, who's a young pastor Paul had trained. Uh, Timothy will have anxiety, but in a good way. He'll be burdened. He'll worry for you. He'll care about you. So it's not a negative when he uses it here through this passage, and that changes the way you read the passage. These aren't negatives. It's positives. But I want your concerns, the things that you're burdened by, to not divide your interest. I want you to be able to be focused on the Lord, how to please the Lord Jesus, how to be holy in body and spirit. Those are specifics he lists. And a married person's attention is divided between spouse and savior, especially in the crisis that they were facing, whatever it was, in the midst of hardship. And Paul's writing, say, I wanna spare you that because they weren't even married yet. They're in the midst of it. There's a crisis. They're not sure how it's gonna end, if people are gonna survive it. He said, right now, I recommend you don't go through with it. And that's a little uncomfortable because the rest of this book, the rest of the Bible teaches that marriage is a really good thing. It's a really good thing. It's a gift. It was God's intended plan for man and woman and to build human civilization. And there's lots of instruction in this book, much of it written by Paul himself in Ephesians and in Colossians on how to build a marriage, how to build a godly family, how to treat each other. It's a good thing and it's worth doing well. But in Corinth, there was a crisis, a hardship, and they weren't sure how much time they had. And so Paul writes his recommendation to not divide your interests right now. Hardship reminds us of eternity. It makes us think about our circumstances. In the midst of hardship, people ask questions like, will it always be like this? Or what what is this for? What's God want to do through this? It made the Corinthians wrestle with hey, this is temporary. This is not our home. It reminded them this is not home. They had been consumed by the world and now they're reminded they're not of this world. They are marked by eternity, by life with Jesus forever, which should remind Christians that we are set aside for his purposes. Hardship reminds us of eternity and eternity reminds us of mission, what we're for why we are still here and not just taken home, why he leaves us in this place because he has things for us to do. He has purposes in our life. And in light of their crisis, Paul thought it was worth skipping domestic life to focus on mission, the mission that Jesus gave us to make disciples of all nations over in the book of Matthew. Now finally, down at verse 35, Paul concludes his exhortation. He says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. He's not trying to restrict their freedom whether they marry or not marry. He's just trying to get them focused to secure their undivided devotion to the Lord because there was hardship and they needed to focus right now. If the hardship passed, then he can go back to entertaining all the other decisions about, okay, how do we build a family? Do we not build a family? Do we stay single, not single? But right now in the hardship, they need to focus. And especially when the time is short, you need to recognize that there is purpose to their lives well beyond their own life goals. This hardship reminds us of eternity, and eternity reminds us of mission. And that should inform your decisions. It should inform my decisions about who to marry, about if you marry, where you live. They need to be on the same, per- uh, same mission. The person that you enter that relationship with needs to be on the same mission, a mission that is informed by eternity, a mission about human souls, about the purposes of God. Even in the midst of hardship, The same Greek professor I quote from earlier, he said, and I think this helps so much in this passage, he just said, consider the weight of this. It's as if uh, God says, I have two events on my agenda and the first one is now done. Just let the weight of that sink in. God tells us, I got two things. 
The first one's done now. There's only one left. The first one was the atonement for sin and a path to redemption for the whole world accomplished through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for all who will accept it. So the first thing is I gotta deal with sin. I'm gonna provide a way to do that. Jesus is gonna do it, and now that's done. It's checked off his list. There's one more. And the one more, redemption's done. The one more is event two, judgment through the return of Christ with a sword. So the path for redemption's done. He's got one more event, judgment. We live, our neighbors live, awaiting that second event. Those of us who are in Christ, the redeemed, we have hope and anticipation about the coming of Jesus, finally. But the lost, they live in ignorance and fear, and that should affect our plans. If we marry, how we marry, who we marry, why, what we do as a marriage, how we save money, how we use money, how we learn that it's not actually our money, how we raise our children, when we raise children, where we raise children, is eternity informing those decisions. You who date, is it informing your fight to stay pure, to obey Christ, since of course your relationship is for his glory and for his use, right? Those who aren't dating, does eternity inform how you think about your singleness and what you do with your time and that available time? And if you are ever going to date or not date, and if you do, what kind of person will you date? Married people, have you talked to God about his purpose for your marriage and your lives and your family? It's a great day to step back and think about this. How does eternity inform the decisions you're making about marriage, about singleness, about family? How does eternity inform your decisions? Paul continues. He'll close out the chapter with some more instructions. There's some details for those who were engaged and they were unsure what to do. And he says, if anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, like there's pressure, if his passions are strong and if it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. It's not sin. Marriage is good. In the midst of the crisis, he wanted to reflect on whether it was a good time to go through with it or they needed to put it on hold. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. It's all good. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. <laughs> Paul doesn't mince words. He does it. Some of the most effective missionaries the church has ever sent were single. And, and speaking of single, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Women have agency in the Bible. Don't you love how he goes back and forth, the male and female? This is different culturally and really, really important. However, he points out if a widow remarries, it needs to be in the Lord. In, in other words, in his will, one of his. You, you marry a, a Christian, a partner who is also informed by eternity just like you are. Yet in my judgment, she's happier if she remains as she is. <laughs> Some of you agree with Paul's judgment. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. He's, he's writing as a believer in my opinion, which some of you share. The Bible is intensely practical. But it begins with a big picture. And Paul spent the last two chapters, before he gets to this, he spent the last two chapters clarifying that your life is not your life. He, he said it back in chapter six. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Those of you who have turned to Jesus, body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It's not your life. In Christ, it's not your body. Your goals need to submit to his goals. So how does eternity inform your decisions? We have this flower in our yard and it's back. 
It's not the exact same one, but it's in the same little cluster of these, some kind of bromeliad. Uh, we have lived in our house for almost five years now, and we had never seen one of these bloom. We didn't know what they were. We saw the leaves, and like, okay, this is fine. We're we'll, gonna like, you know, keep weeds out of the garden. Whatever, never saw one bloom until four weeks after Hurricane Ian uh, did this to our yard and gave us three feet of this, this beautiful brackish salt and whatever. Three feet of that. Four weeks later, that flower bloomed for the first time we'd ever seen it. Which let, it needed more water, I guess. <laughs> and some salt, a lot. Um, and that led us to call it our hurricane flower. Because apparently some things thrive after a storm. After hardship. Hardship reminds us of eternity. Eternity reminds us of mission. Can I pray for us? Father, I'm so grateful for um, just the details that sometimes show up here in your word. And it's tricky because we don't always understand everything that was happening at that church, but we, we, we try to pull the pieces together and and wrestle with what you say in other places and to make sense out of that. And God, I'm grateful that you give us really specific things for specific things people were dealing with. You care about the day-to-day. -day. You even care about distractions and worries and anxiety and our concerns. And Father, I'm just grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the way over and over you draw us back to eternity to recognize that your perspective is so much bigger. Our perspective can be so much bigger because, Lord, we're made for eternity. It makes it so much easier to look at our day-to-day -day lives and ask bigger questions about what are we for and what do you want to do with our day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you, our thanks. Our prayer team is up here Today may be a day you're wrestling with stuff and some of your own distractions and worries and need somebody to pray with you. Also want to remind you, last week Matt introduced the idea of mission champions. We've got a handful of mission efforts around the globe and locally. We've been praying for people to rise up and kind of be champions for those. If you're interested in that, there'll be a quick meeting right out in auditorium two. So right outside these doors, you can head in there and um, learn a little more about that. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you, church.